magnificent Saturn, with its beautiful and complex ring system, has recently been explored close up by interplanetary spacecraft. During this edition of Astronomy Toronto, we'll take an in-depth look at the results from Saturn. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood, and I'm a member of the Toronto Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Tonight, we're going to look at Saturn. And with me to help, help me look at Saturn is Paul Deans, who is a producer at the McLaughlin Planetarium and has been working on Saturn and its rings for the last couple of years. Thanks very much, Paul, for coming today. My pleasure. Paul, you were at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California where the pictures were received uh, from the Voyager spacecraft during uh, the Voyager 1 encounter and Voyager 2 encounters with Saturn. Could, what was it really like seeing all these pictures come back from a mil billion miles away, uh, pictures of things seen for the first time? It was uh, quite exciting, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, in a lot of cases, it was things that no one had ever seen, no one had expected to see. And uh, the way it was set up, uh, people could actually cluster around black and white television monitors and watch the photos come back live, see them, and know that you were seeing them at the same time as scientists uh, three buildings down were looking at them. And you could literally make your own discoveries uh, at the same time as the scientists were doing. The strange thing was that once the pictures came in, everyone wanted to say, what's that? What is that? That's right. And the scientists said, look, <laughs> I'm just seeing them for the first time. That's too. right. There was uh, a lot of instant science going on at this sort of thing. Uh, you would see a picture, and 12 hours later, uh, the scientists would be forced to try and come up with some sort of interpretation as to some new discovery. Well, as a background, Paul, maybe we'll just take a look at a film which uh, talks about Saturn, maybe gives everyone a background of what Saturn is, and Saturn up until Voyager. That's right. Saturn is the sixth planet out from the Sun. At a distance of about a billion kilometers from the Earth, it appears in the Toronto sky as a bright star. In this picture, Saturn appears as the bright star in the center of the photograph. The brighter star at the right is the planet Jupiter. During the spring of 1982, Saturn rises just after midnight, appearing close to the planets Mars and Jupiter. Although Saturn's existence has always been known to man, it was not until the telescope was discovered that the rings could be seen. In 1610, when Galileo turned his small telescope to Saturn, he could see what he called ears on the planet. In a few years, these ears mysteriously disappeared, but after a time, reappeared again. Galileo thought his telescope was playing tricks on him, but as we can see in these pictures taken of Saturn at different points in its orbit, the inclination of the rings vary as seen from the Earth. This is due to the inclination of Saturn's poles. Like the Earth, Saturn experiences seasons. As telescopes improved, so did the views of Saturn. This view of Saturn by Cassini shows a small division in the ring, which now bears his name, the Cassini division. A Dutch astronomer, Huygens, determined that the rings could not be solid but must be made up of particles. From Earth-based telescopes, astronomers can see only so much detail under the best of conditions. The detail is lost because one must peer through our turbulent atmosphere. All the close-up views we had of Saturn were only artists' conceptions. Here are some paintings of Saturn made by artists depicting what Saturn may look like from some of its closer moons. Ideas about the sizes of the particles have varied from sandy particles in size up to the size of city blocks. It was not until Voyager 1 passed Saturn in November of 1980 where we got our first real close look at Saturn. We've been talking about the Voyager spacecraft. We, we'll take a look at a, a film of the Voyager spacecraft now, and you'll see that the results, how, how they could control that, that machinery a billion miles away has been the ending of, of 20 years of basic development. The first spacecraft they sent out to the close planets Mars and Venus just went by, maybe snapped a few black and white pictures. But this 
film that we're going to show you on the Voyager spacecraft will show you that these were really beautiful machines and they gave us the first really nice close looks at Jupiter and Saturn. So we'll look at that film now. The Voyager spacecraft, Voyagers 1 and 2, were launched a few weeks apart in the late summer of 1977. On voyages of discovery, they would give man close-up views of the planets Jupiter and Saturn, and if we're lucky, the planets Uranus and Neptune. The spacecraft weighs 795 kilograms. Its most noticeable part is the white 3.5 meter dish antenna used to send and receive radio signals from Earth. The nuclear power source is contained on the boom to the left. On the right side is the science boom on which the cameras are located. These cameras are on a scan platform which can move up and down, left and right, to take pictures so that the antenna can always be pointed towards the Earth. These commands to tell the cameras which way to point are stored in several small computers inside Voyager. After the Voyagers pass their target, they will leave the solar system and head for the stars. Attached to each spacecraft is a record which contains greetings in 60 languages, over 100 digitalized photographs, and 90 minutes of music. The sounds and sights of our Earth are there for any being who might find Voyager sometime within the next few billions of years. This is how Voyager might look in space on its way from the Earth. Shortly after launch, Voyager 1 turned around to look back at its home. The crescent Earth is at the right and the moon at the left. It took about a half, one and a half years to reach Jupiter. When the Voyagers arrived, the jovial planet put on quite a show. As Voyager drew closer, it could see the four Galilean moons, named after Galileo, race around the planet. Details in the cloud system, never before dreamed of, could be well seen. Clouds circulating around the massive storm, called the Great Red Spot, can be seen in these series of photos. Each of the Galilean moons were seen close up. These four worlds, known up until now as only points of light, had their own identity. Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io. The most remarkable discovery was active volcanoes on Io, seen as blue sulfur plumes at the top left. Voyager also discovered a thin ring around Jupiter. This made Jupiter the third planet known to have a ring. A ring around Uranus was discovered in 1977 by astronomers using a telescope in a jet aircraft. The results at Jupiter gave astronomers more information about how our solar system is now and how it may have been when it was formed four and a half billion years ago. It also made them anxious to see what was ahead at Saturn. Well, the most exciting thing, of course, that they were waiting to see was the rings of Saturn. Because there, as far as we knew, there were nothing like that in the solar system. That's right. Uh, rings were unique 
for Saturn until 1977. Uh, then the small set of rings around Uranus were discovered, 79, the Jupiter ring. Uh, I should perhaps mention that the Voyager spacecraft, the two of them had uh, a couple of different missions. Voyager 1, its prime goal was a moon called Titan, and uh, they wanted to have a good look to see if perhaps there was life on that particular world. And Voyager 2 was uh, almost a backup to that. If Voyager 1 had failed, Voyager 2 would have been retargeted and would have done Titan again. However, fortunately, Voyager 1 was very successful, had a good look at Titan, discovered there was nothing to see, really. And uh, so Voyager 2 kept on its original mission, which was rings, primarily, and uh, as a secondary, have a look at the planet. Uh, Voyager 2 went in much closer to the rings of Saturn than did Voyager 1, just specifically for that sort of look at the rings. Well, one of the most confusing and difficult things to get straight with Saturn is the rings. So we've got a picture of Saturn here. And Maybe, Paul, you could show us what we're going to be talking about when we talk about the, uh, the, the different rings. Right, okay. Well, on uh, this view of Voyager 2, uh, it's a color composite, and uh, you can see the two broad exterior areas of the ring, which is uh, the easiest spot, I guess, to have a look at, at the three main divisions that you can see. Uh, the very outer edge all the way around is known as the A ring, uh, the dark band dark gap is Cassini's division. A very broad interior ring is the B ring. It also happens to be the brightest ring. And very faintly, just on the inside of the B ring, is a very faint ring known as the C ring. Now, there are other rings uh, that are difficult, if not impossible, to see in a shot like this. Uh, just to briefly mention them, closer in to Saturn, a D ring. Uh, going out the other way, out beyond the A ring, is a very thin little F ring. And uh, further out is a G ring. There's also an E ring. And uh, it's a little confusing, except for A, B, C, and D going inward. The reason for the uh, mess, if you like, uh, some in, some out, is because they were named in order of discovery, basically. And it was done back in a time when people believed uh, quite firmly that there were only three or four or five rings. And uh, that was one of the main things that Voyager discovered, that in fact there is more than just uh, the rings out to E and H, that all of those rings, especially A, B, and C, have a lot more to them in the way of detail. Now, just uh, by way of intro to the whole rings, I guess, uh, the first slide that we have, uh, we just quickly went through in the intro to the show. It's a view of Saturn as seen by Voyager pulling away. And I just started, decided to start off with this first slide simply because uh, it gives you a slightly different feel for what Saturn looks like uh, than the uh, image that we just showed. Uh, it is the view going away, and uh, you see something that we do not see ever from the Earth. No, we'd never see shadow that. shadow on the rings. Uh, other than that, again, you can see some of the general detail, the A ring on the outside and the very broad B ring. Now, the next slide is Saturn again after encounter, but this is seen from underneath the mm -hmm. ring. Uh, the shot before, sunlight was reflecting off the rings. Here, sunlight is trying to trickle through the rings, and this is very important. Astronomers wanted to get both views, above and below the rings. Uh, this is very difficult to uh, explain exactly which ring is which, but right mm -hmm. in the center of the rings where it's really dark is, believe it or not, the B ring, which looks bright from the Earth. When you see it from the unlit side, it looks very dark. Now, the next slide is an example of what Voyager 2 wanted to do, very close-up images of the rings. Here, you're looking into the B ring, and you see nothing but little tiny ringlets, all the way down to the limit of resolution, which is something on the order of 10 kilometers. And this is, I guess, the prime discovery, if you like, of the Voyager missions as far as the ring goes, that it's not, the B ring is not some broad thing. It breaks down into, as one scientist said, perhaps upwards of a million different little ringlets throughout the entire system. Now, another thing that was uh, discovered was that the rings don't match. Uh, you might think that they would go around Saturn in perfect circles. In fact, they appear in some spots at least to be slightly elliptical. And the next slide shows uh, what happens if you take one side of Saturn's rings and match it to the other side. And it doesn't match. This is right around that gap known as Cassini's division, which is off to the right. You see a very tiny little ringlet in there that doesn't match at all. And in fact, all of the little features, the little ringlets finally match, 
several hundred kilometers off to the left-hand side of the view, and that is where they tied this all together. Now, just as a point of interest, the next shot is something that is so different that I don't think we'll ever see again, really, because the timing was incredible. This is a view 90 seconds before the spacecraft passed the ring plane. Uh, as we saw in the intro, it went diving down through the rings. Well, 90 seconds before it did that, and it's going at many tens of thousands of kilometers an hour, it snapped this photo. Uh, if you could see Saturn in this view, it would be off to the right. So what you're seeing are the rings almost edge on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, about it's just like a, a big uh, record player. Right? That's right, that's right. About the only feature that's easy to see right down at the bottom of the screen, the very bright ring is the F ring, then there's the gap moving up, and then the broad and fairly bright A ring. And after that, it gets very difficult to tell exactly what is going on. And finally, for this uh, set of slides, the next one shows one feature that everybody was very curious about was another great discovery, especially for Voyager 1, because it was unexpected, and that's the spokes. What you see here are some dark streak features right in the middle of the B ring. And this was, as I mentioned, first discovered by Voyager 1, and nobody really knew what to make of it. When the spacecraft, both Voyager 1 and 2, went behind Saturn and looked at Saturn from behind, the spokes turned white. Here you see them black, you see them as the spacecraft is approaching. And this is uh, one of the things that gave the hint as to what possibly the spokes might be and some possible suggestions for explaining them. Now, the spokes are very nice to look at in motion mm -hmm. because uh, that is something that can tell you a little bit more about them, I think. And uh, we have some videotape clips of the spokes in motion. But first, just to give you a, a feel of what the spacecraft looked like, uh, if we could roll the tape, the first thing that you're going to see is Saturn, as seen from the spacecraft, mm -hmm. as the spacecraft zoomed in towards the planet, and so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The planet itself is a little bland, but it just gives you a feel. This was taken about every 10 hours, mm -hmm. and the spacecraft is just literally rushing right in. Now this was taken, uh, these images were taken very quickly, one after the other, and put together into a motion picture of some rotation. Again, because Saturn is so bland, you can't see much except for the satellites. Now we come to spokes. You see the little dots, those are the satellites, but if you look in the center of the rings, you'll see some dark features strolling across the face of the picture, and those dark features are the spokes. Now, there are several different views. Uh, this view is taken going away, and if you look by the shadow, down at the bottom of the shadow, you should be able to see some bright spokes coming out from the shadow and starting to sweep around towards the right of the screen. All right, there's some there. This was by Voyager 1 as it went away from Saturn. Mm -hmm. And we're back to the dark spokes from the That's other side. That's right. This is approaching, and again, you can see the spokes uh, almost like a set of bicycle spokes uh, spinning around. This is called the Saturn 500, and it is a wonderful little movie put together of about 50 frames and you see the dark images, they've tried to follow a set of spokes around. And we see it again. And if you watch, just after the picture comes back, right about here, if you have a look, you might be able to see a spoke almost instantaneously appearing. We'll have a look at it again. This occurred in a space of 12 seconds from frame to frame. And it is, it is difficult to catch, but that tells you just how fast some of these things are. Another sequence of shots, the Voyager camera was aimed to one part of the B-ring and simply images were shot again and again and again over uh, a period of about an hour. And here you see the spokes sweeping past and you get a feeling for their motion and rotation. They twist a bit, they form, they dissolve. And uh, one would think uh, with all of this activity that uh, you should be able to figure out uh, exactly what is going on with the spokes. But believe it or not, it is still really a great question mark. We do know that the spokes are made of very tiny, tiny particles, uh, smaller than millimeters, just really specks of dust, that have somehow been puffed up above the ring plane. And we know they're small because of the way light is reflected off mm -hmm. them. And they've been puffed up, and as they rotate around, they're slowly dragged back down towards the rings of Saturn. And they, when they hit the rings, they disintegrate. Now, what causes them to puff up? Nobody is, is really too sure. Some people think it's related to the magnetic field of Saturn. 
Uh, others think it has to do with the sunlight hitting them as they come out from behind the shadow. Still others think that there's some sort of electrostatic or static cling, if you like, to the rings. Uh, that is a subject of great debate right now. Well, the, uh, the Voyager took thousands and thousands of photographs, but it also had other instruments on it. Uh, searched radio waves, they uh, looked, took infrared pictures of, of uh, Saturn. What other things did uh, Voyager do? Well, Voyager 2 had uh, a very interesting uh, little device called a photopolarimeter. And what it does is it measures light, uh, usually coming from surfaces of moons and surfaces of the rings, to try and get a feel for the chemistry of the stuff that it's looking at. However, in the case of Voyager 2, it was re-aimed to watch a star as it came out from behind Saturn. And the whole point of this was to measure starlight as it went flickering from behind the rings. Now, there was a little bit of debate because what scientists wanted to do was measure this flickering starlight about once every tenth of a second and beam it back immediately to Earth. And to do that, they had to sacrifice the cameras. Mm -hmm. So for two and a half hours, while the spacecraft and this photopolarimeter was tracking this star, the cameras were shut off. So they lost two and a half hours of what would have been very high resolution images of the rings. What they got was something even better. And rather than trying to explain uh, just how this thing works, we have another uh, short video clip showing the experiment, the photopolarimeter experiment. So if we can roll the tape, the first thing you'll see is the spacecraft is zooming in towards the planet and basically getting ready to uh, start the experiment. Now, the photopolarimeter is aimed at the star as it comes out from behind the dark side of the planet. And that should be coming up very shortly. And what it measures is the amount of sunlight coming through. Now, this is about the best that you can see with camera images. Yeah, and they, it, they, they never s actually took a picture of the particles, and this That's was right. the only way they could really find out how, you know, what size of particles there That's were. That's right. Uh, the best you can do with shots like this is something on the order of 10 kilometers uh, worth of resolution, and what they wanted was something better than that. So as Voyager swept past, uh, that is the Voyager 1, there is the Voyager 2 trajectory, it managed to look at the light coming from a star called Delta Scorpii. Mm -hmm. And as it, uh, there is the star in the star field, uh, it's a rather bright star. You can, it's a summer star for Toronto, and you can see it with your, your naked eye. That's right. And you transfer that to the sky. And then uh, on top of this, we add the planet. And you can see it just coming out from behind the planet. This is what the photopolarimeter watched. What they got back was the line that you see down at the bottom. And you see the dips, because as it passes ring material, if the ring material is very thick, very little light gets through, such as now. If the ring material is thin, you'll see the light level bounce up. When it hits Cassini's division, it will leap up. There it goes. It goes back down for the A ring. And there's a little gap called Enki's division. It will bounce up briefly. And then you get to see the F ring. That is the output that they got, uh, mm -hmm. literally on a, a little graph like that. Just dots and dots and dots for city blocks of paper. They That's have. right. Uh, they wound up with uh, almost uh, two-thirds of a kilometer worth of output paper scrolled all over the place. And out of that, of course, the demand was very great. What did you see? And uh, one of the experimenters said, well, in all honesty, if you come back in 1986, when uh, Voyager is going past Uranus, I will have studied this long enough. I will be able to tell you what all the rings are. But uh, that wasn't good enough, of course, for everybody. So uh, we have some more slides of two selected areas. Uh, the first slide it just uh, generally shows uh, the two regions that I'm going to mention. It's a view of the outer ring. Uh, the A ring is off to the left-hand side. You see in the middle of the A ring a very faint dark gap. That is known as Enki's division. And out beyond the A ring, there's a gap and a very thin little strand, and that is the F ring. Those are the two areas that uh, were looked at by the folks uh, doing this photopolarimeter experiment. Now, the next slide shows Enki's division very closely. It's that dark gap. This is one of the best photos of it, and you see a very bright strand in there, a little wee ringlet. Nobody knew exactly what it looked like. The next slide is the PPS view, or photopolarimeter view of that. And the red is that little ringlet, but you can see that there's much more. And in fact, the little ringlet itself is, uh, can be broken down even further. 
So this is a computer-made picture? That's right. That's right. This is not an actual photograph. A uh, photograph is what we have for the next slide. Mm -hmm. The next slide is one of the best views of the F-ring seen by Voyager 2. And if you counted, you could count maybe five strands in that F-ring. And finally, the next one is the PPS view, photopolarimeter view of the F-ring again. And you note there's an incredible number of strands in that ring. And the very bright area uh, can be broken down even further, in fact, and uh, you get an incredible wealth of detail. And so suddenly, uh, with this photopolarimeter experiment, you see little ringlets on the order of 100 meters across. Mm -hmm. And there is the suspicion that uh, you can go even further down for even greater detail. Well, the F-ring was the one that they thought was braided. Uh, what, ha what was the That's results right. from Voyager 2? Voyager 2 saw no braiding whatsoever. And so the thought is now that perhaps uh, some of the same forces that cause the spokes to puff up might also be affecting the little particles within the F-ring, because most of the F-ring is made up of very small particles. So it could be subjected to gravitational forces or static forces. And so you could get some sort of crossing over and uncrossing. That Voyager 1 happened to see. When Voyager 2 went by, it was gone. Uh, another spacecraft, you might be able to see it again. For more information on the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, write to the McLaughlin Planetarium, 100 Queen's Park, Toronto, M5S 2C6. Thank <laughs> you.